I like to think there's this uh, universal, universal kind of uh, balance between what's wrong and what's right. It's a really hard one um, because you'd be tempted to say, oh, it's about what I feel, but I think that feelings are quite fickle. We are not God, so like at the end we don't truly know what it would be the decision of, you know, the for God himself. I have a problem with that moral thing personally because there are rules and, and policies and set by, so there are standards set by society. For me it's, uh, it's of right and wrong is uh, to a certain extent uh, self-evident in a sense. I don't want, if, if I wanted to be treated in, in, a, in a certain way then I have to treat other people in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way that I would want to be treated. I think it's kind of up to each person individually. Um, and there are, there are several things that I might think are right that someone else might think is wrong. And I think it's just your morals. Obviously, some, some people don't know the fine lines between right and wrong, but I think it's mainly the importance of your upbringing that, that helps you decide. Well, that's more like psychological, isn't it? So I think you kind of essentially start thinking right from wrong from your parents. The society uh, was, was like taught me how to to uh, how to distinguish right from wrong. Personally, I don't think there is right or wrong. I think it's whatever people believe in. Well, I think it's up to up to us. I, I don't think there's like fundamental right and wrong. For me, it's right if it doesn't if it doesn't harm people. If it doesn't harm people gratuitously. I don't think you'll ever be really sure of what's right, right, and what's wrong, wrong. We're going to hear from Professor George Ellis. He is the Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Complex Systems in the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He co-authored The Large-Scale Structure of Space, Time with University of Cambridge physicist Stephen Hawking. I'm sorry, I should have said that better, shouldn't I? He co-authored The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time. Now you've got it. It was published in 1973 it's considered one of the world's leading theorists in cosmology. He's an active Quaker, and in 2004, he won the Templeton Prize. From 1989 to 1992, he served as president of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation. He's a past president of the International Society for Science and Religion. He's visiting professor of the physics department in Oxford, from 2016 and 2018, and visiting professor of complex systems at the Said Business School. He's the author of several important books, including one with the title On the Moral Nature of the Universe, Cosmology, Theology, and Ethics, published in 1996. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Professor George Ellis. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here, and I feel rather shy after that wonderful introduction. Quite a lot of what I want to say <laughs> has already been said by our host. Um, who am I? I'm the Professor Emeritus of Applied Maths at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, visiting Professor Said School of Business at Oxford University. I do some work on physics at the moment time, but I work on the philosophy of cosmology on the one hand, and the nature of complexity on the other, in particular how brain function is based in physics. I was born in Johannesburg and then my family moved to Cape Town when I was 12. I studied physics at the University of Cape Town, enjoyed many social and sporting activities at the university. I used to sail dinghies, row in a rowing boat, climb Table Mountain. Uh, I was a dab hand at ballroom dancing, bop and rock and roll. <laughs> I was not very politically active. I was living life to the full as it was offered to me. After getting an honors degree from the University of Cape Town, I came as a graduate student to Cambridge University, which is a somewhat intimidating experience for a boy from Cape Town, who, when there were so many people there who already knew each other and had social bonds. 
but I formed friendships, played tennis, squash road for my college, attended philosophy lectures, and started research on Einstein's theory of general relativity, the best theory of gravity that we have. And I was greatly fortunate to be there in the golden days of general relativity, and particularly to have collaborated with Stephen Hawking on a couple of papers and writing this book, which has just been mentioned, which is a very technical book. During this time, I was a strong member of the Anglican Church and of the student Christian movement. I returned to South Africa in 1973 to be head of the Department of Applied Mathematics of the University of Cape Town, and also to be near my mother. I set up a research group in general relativity and was delighted to have some very excellent research students. However, this was the time of apartheid in South Africa, with black people being deprived of human rights, dispossessed of their homes, hounded by the police, being detained and tortured. I came from a liberal family who did what they could to fight for black rights and opposed this, this oppression. My father was a newspaper editor who got fired from his job for standing up for black rights. My mother was a member of the Black Sash, which is a wonderful women's group that protested against the loss of blacks' rights, provided them with practical assistance through advice officers. Overall, I belong to a wonderful liberal group of people in the old-fashioned sense of that world, namely people believing in equality of all and the value of all and fighting for their rights. We did everything we could to expose and oppose the evils of the National Party's brutal apartheid policy. I spent a lot of time doing this as a member of the Quakers in Cape Town because I'd become a Quaker by then and as chairman of the South African Institute of Race Relations. That was political work, but I was also engaged in welfare work through a variety of organizations, such as Quaker Service and the Friends of the Siskai. We provided milk for starving children, soup to squatters when shanties were being burnt down to the police, plastic to provide them with temporary shelter, money for orphanages and old age homes, and so on. All of this centrally raised the issue of values. What is worth doing? What do we value? and who do we value? Famously, it has been said that a society will be judged by the way it treats the most vulnerable of its members. These were being tortured and killed in South Africa. So I want now to talk about three interrelated things, values, ethics, and morality. I will carefully explain what I mean in each case because they're used in different ways by different people. For each of us individually, for society as a whole, and for organizations we belong to, a core issue is what values underlie our actions. Are we just looking after our own welfare and that of our family, or are we looking after the welfare of others, even strangers we do not know? Values are centrally important. They're central to individual and social life because they shape all our activities by setting their purpose. When my friends were running an organization called Friends of the Siskai, we employed a young woman just out of university as a field worker to assist impoverished communities in the Eastern Cape. She got to know their needs and planned how she could help them. She is still doing that now, 40 years later. She is at present campaigning against a law that is being passed by the South African government that will make all these people living in the old tribal homeland serfs with effectively no rights against the wishes of the tribal chiefs. The talk she gave about this to a Black Sash meeting I attended a few weeks ago was a model of well-informed analysis and a passionate argument against what was being done, such as people losing their homes because the chief wants the ground they stand on. What she does is passionately based in valuing people as people. It is her life work, and it is who she is. The point is, for each of us, our values drive our lives, determining the choices we make Indeed, they define what kind of people we are. Now, we've been very, very lucky in South Africa to have had two giants in this area. Bishop Tutu has consistently stood for methods of reconciliation based on valuing each person for what they are and eschewing hatred. When I was chairman of the Western Cape branch of the Institute of Race Relations, I had the privilege of chairing a public meeting in Cape Town where he addressed a large crowd of people, both black and white, in what response to what was happening at that time in the townships, where police were killing black youths, arresting people, and torturing them. By his wonderful humor and presence, he conveyed his message of compassion and forgiveness that was deeply based in his Christian faith, giving the crowd hope and courage. 
It was clear that he valued them and respected them and was prepared to stand up for them against the authorities. Bishop Tutu worked in a transformative partnership with Nelson Mandela, who led the country on a path of reconciliation that avoided the major civil war that was looming at that time because he refused to demonize the opposition no matter what happened. One of the proudest moments in my life was in 1990, after the change of government, I got a phone call from the presidency telling me he had chosen to award me the Star of South Africa medal in recognition of work I had done promoting science in the country. I literally danced with joy in my bedroom <laughs> because I was going to meet him and receive this medal from him in person. His ethical stance had inspired me and so many that attitudes changed through the country and avoided disaster. So I want now to consider ethics and morality. Ethics is a set of explicit or implicit guidelines in society about how they ought to behave and shape how we actually behave. So that's ethics. On the other hand, morality is about what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, as a matter of fact. This can be as regards values and intentions, or ethics and behavior, or outcomes. Each can be right or wrong. Intentions can be good or bad, ethics can be good or bad, and outcomes can be good or bad. The key point is to distinguish ethics, which is culturally dependent rules of behavior, and morality, timeless and eternal standards of right and wrong, independent of how people behave. The crucial feature of morals is their universality. What is right and wrong does not change with time or place. Morality is timeless, eternal, and unchanging. In other words, I'm a strong believer in moral realism. St. Augustine stated it this way. Right is right even when no one is doing it. Wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it. My experience in the apartheid days made it completely clear to me that it is crucial to be able to say that something is evil as a matter of fact. If we can't do so, we have moral relativism. Our opponents can say there is nothing wrong with apartheid or the Holocaust. It's just one way of behavior amongst many that a particular community has chosen to adopt. If there was true, there would be no particular morality about Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela did. It would be just one way of behaving with no more validity than any other. And the same would apply to myself and all the others in my community who fought apartheid. We would be saying there is in fact no such thing as good and evil. And there is no way I can agree with this. Ethics is a social understanding and is not the same as morality, which is universal. Ethics has changed over the centuries, while morality is what it was at the Big Bang, or perhaps even before the universe began. Morality is the same everywhere at all times and places, unlike ethics, which varies. Ethical progress resides in individuals or communities discovering the true nature of morality and moving towards the practice of ethics that reflects the nature of morality. For example, utilitarian, instead of intrinsic value, will lead us astray, and has done so. At key times in history, when morality and utility have clashed, invariably ethics based on morality has proved right in the long term. Slavery, child labor, the Holocaust were all justified by references to utilitarian concepts. They were, however, opposed on moral grounds. They were wrong because they were wrong. I am proud of my Quaker tradition that fought against slavery in a peaceful manner when it was a taken for granted aspect of society. It was part of the economic order and was taken to be right because it produced much needed crops and wealth. Now, what about claims made that a materialist or atheist approach can explain morality through a scientific understanding? There have been essentially three claims about how that might be so. The first is to say values are of social or origin. They are required in order that society works well. So that is what is good, a well-functioning society. Second, it's been claimed it's of evolutionary origin promoting survival. On this view, survival is the ultimate evolutionary value and so must be good. The third argument made is that values are of psychological origin to do with feeling good and so happiness is good. This leads to a claim that oxytocin is a moral molecule. I kid you not. <laughs> because it makes us happy. 
None of these, in fact, relate to what is good and bad. They relate to ethics in the way I've described it, not morality. They simply avoid the real question. Each of these alleged groundings for morality, in fact, fails. If morality were to do just with social behavior that is good for society, where does that judgment, good, come from? What is good for society? It's a value judgment pulled out of a hat. Does it mean society is working well? If so, for who? In what way? In terms of health or wealth or resolving conflict or technological progress or what? The issue is what is a good society and to say that morality is to do with society running well doesn't get to grips with what a good society is. The second one is the evolutionary argument and it's been developed in terms of sophisticated arguments about group selection and kin selection, and some of you will know about that. The basic assumption is that survival is good because that is what fitness refers to. But survival of who and by what means? It opens the way to eugenics and the slaughter of the opponents by any means whatever. It manifestly fails to value people as people. And the psychological argument is about feeling good. It opens the way to drugs and hedonism as the road to goodness, because drugs can make you feel good. Forget about others. What matters to you is how you feel as an individual. So take your oxytocin and tablets and all is well. Nothing about contributing to society or caring for others. None of these arguments, in fact, relate to what is actually good or bad. The key underlying point is what David Hume pointed out a long time ago, you can't get an ought from an is. I'll repeat that, you can't get an ought from an is. Because the fact that something happens or has happened simply does not imply it ought to have happened. These approaches simply do not comprehend the moral dimension. Good is not just physical, food, health, shelter, clothes and so on. It embraces tenderness and caring and love and arguably spiritual issues as well. These are a completely different dimension to what those proposals engage with. Good is about what ought to happen, what is right and wrong. Science is about what exists and what has happened or will happen. They're simply not the same. The fact that something happens has nothing to say about whether it is good or bad. I'll give you an example. My granddaughter is a prominent climate change activist in Wuppertal in Germany. She's passionate about what is happening in terms of the effect of global climate change and the way it will threaten people's lives in the future. Now, she does not do this in an ill-informed way. She and her friends attend seminars with the climate change group at the Bergische Universität in Wuppertal. So they are well informed on the scientific consensus about what is happening as regard changing weather patterns and the associated disasters, rising sea levels, floods, extreme heat, fires, and so on. But the key point now is that, assuming this is all correct, science itself cannot say if any of these things are good or are bad. That's a moral judgment based on what science says the outcomes will be, but not implied by the sciences. For example, anthropogenic climate change is recognized as a major threat to global biodiversity and will probably lead to the extension of many species over the next hundred years through habitat loss. This is a generally agreed scientific fact, but science cannot say if that extinction of species is good or bad. That's bringing in an ethical judge, and science has no way of making any ethical judgment. Right and wrong are simply not materialistic ideas. Science cannot determine what is good or bad, and I've argued <coughs> with some scientists about this. When I've been challenged, I've simply said to my opponent, since you say morality can be derived from a scientific basis, please will you construct me a morality meter, a meter that I can point at an argument between two people and it'll tell me who is good, who is right and who is wrong, who is good and who is bad. I want a meter which will give you a measurement of good in terms of Millie Tutus and bad in terms of Millie Hitlers. Okay. You can't. It's nonsense. It cannot be done because science has got nothing to do with good or bad. It's not a dimension which science is able to comprehend. Now, as we've already heard, and I strongly agree with what has been said, the true 
nature of morality of Christianity is laid out in the Gospels and particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. But for me, a transformative experience was attending a study group at Cambridge with my colleagues in the student Christian movement on readings in St. John Gospel by Archbishop William Temple, which for me is one of the great, great pieces of Christian literature. And he talks about the, the temptations and the devil and how Christ was trying to see what was his way forward. And he says Christ eventually discovered, he recognizes that the new conception which takes the places of all those rejected in the wilderness is that the manifestation of love by which it wins its response is always sacrifice. The principle of sacrifice is that we choose to do or suffer what apart from our love we should not choose to do or to suffer. When love is returned, the sacrifice is the most joyful thing in the world, and heaven is the life of joyful sacrifice. But in the selfish world, it must be painful, and that pain is the source of triumph. And that's the principle of deep ethics, self-emptying, or being prepared to give freely up on behalf of others. It has a transforming nature that contrasts strongly with all the other visions of ethics which other people have had. It's what I will call deep ethics. It's a profound principle. I'll just give you one example from the dark days of apartheid. Cape Town Quakers employed a worker called Rommel Roberts as a peace worker in the townships. He reported to me about what he was doing and I had to help give him guidance. Now, he was one of only two people I know who prevented the burning to death of an African man by a township mob at that time. He strode into a torrid situation where a mob was about to execute a man by burning. And he told them to stop. He held up his hand and said, stop it. Do not kill this man in this way. And by exuding moral authority, he succeeded in preventing a brutal execution by burning to death. But by doing so, he had put himself in mortal danger in behalf of someone he did not know. The crowd could easily have turned on him and executed both of them. The other person who I know who did that was Bishop Tutu. Living out his life values of seeing other people as people, respecting them, and seeing them as the children of God. So this understanding greatly reinforces the message of this talk. Scientific approaches to explaining ethics don't begin to get anywhere near explaining the paradoxical nature of deep morality I've just been talking about, precisely because they're in fact all based on self-interest in one form or another. They cannot comprehend the idea of transforming the situation through loving action on behalf of others, even an enemy. They simply don't understand the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what I want to do is to explain that, in my view, this deep morality is a part of the structure of the cosmos. I used to be on the board of the South African Astronomical Observatory at Sutherland, about three hours from Cape Town. At night there, I used to look up with wonder at the dark sky, covered with thousands of stars and the grand sweep of the Milky Way, and wonder how many eyes out there were looking back at me. I used to wonder if there were thousands or millions or many billions. Since those days, astronomy has made a lot of progress in detecting exoplanets, an inconceivably difficult task as they're so far away and their light is masked by the stars they are circling. It is a probable there are billions of planets out there and there are billions of suitable inhabitants for intelligent life. What would their take on morality be? That's the question. What kind of ethics and morality will they recognize? It is my strong belief that they will have discovered the same kind of morality that I've just been talking about, the morality of sacrifice on behalf of others and its transformational nature. I think they will discover it because it's part of the way things are. It is an abstract nature of the universe and has been so since time immemorial and will be discovered to be so by any intelligent being. Now, why do I believe this? For two reasons. First because it is the understanding of the spiritual wing of all the major world religions. And I emphasize the spiritual wing of all the major world religions. So John Templeton wrote a wonderful little book about this called Agape Love, where he talks, he looks at each of the major world religions and talks about how, and it gives you extracts where they talk about a transformational ethic of this kind. 
Now, I experienced this when I gave a talk similar to this one in California many years ago as part of a series of meetings called Science and the Spiritual Quest. When I'd finished my talk, a swarthy young man came rushing up to me and said excitedly, that was wonderful. You spoke like a true Muslim. <laughs> it turned out he was director of a Muslim center in London. And I believe it, that this nature of morality is out there and will be discovered independently by any of the spiritual leaders who really take the time. And remember, Christ spent from a young man until 30 trying to work out what he should do. Martin Luther King, who is one of the people who developed this kind of understanding as a spiritual leader, spent seven years thinking about what he should do. Mahatma Gandhi did the same, and they all lived this kind of life. They proved it could be a way of acting in the world. So I believe that this is part of the deep structure of the universe because it is, has been, and will be discovered by intelligent spiritual people throughout the universe. But in addition, it's self-authenticating. It has a transformational nature in many contexts that is experienced as morally true when it happens. Its value and validity is confirmed by each of the domains where it applies. It is a unifying theme for the deep roots of transformational ethics. So I don't just believe in moral realism, but farther that the underlying mor morality is of this self-sacrificial transformative nature. This is profound because it transforms and it's paradoxical. It confounds the calculation of less and more that is beloved of economists. That is indeed the point. It cannot be encompassed in calculations of any kind. It cannot be hardwired in any evolutionary forces. And there's a link to this cathedral. This cathedral is one of a group of cathedrals which have crosses of nails. And Dresden Cathedral is one of the other one. Uh, my um, daughter-in-law was a structural engineer on the reconstruction of the Frauenkirche in Des Dresden. And one of the bomber pilots who dropped those flames that destroyed Dresden, the firestorm that killed 75,000 people, had a son who made one of those crosses and took it to Dresden and it is now at the top of the crown kirche as a symbol of reconciliation between the nations that were bitterly at war with each other. And this cathedral is part of this, and I understand that a cross from Dresden has been brought to this cathedral as part of this reconciliatory motion which tries to bring forward and make true the kind of thing that I have been talking about. So, in my view, the nature of morality that I've been talking about greatly strengthens arguments against any purely materialistic attempts to derive the nature of ethics from morality. Scientific explanations try to reduce to self-interest, and that is precisely what it is not. True morality is based in love for the other. That's the underlying deep value. So moral realism of this kind points to meaning and purpose underlying physical existence. How can such a moral kenotic morality come about? It must reflect the forces or intentions that created the universe because it is part of the deep structure of the cosmos. This strongly suggests a creator whose central value is love. How else can you explain it? Other things are just physical things exist and this is where they point. Thank you for listening.